for joining us. And it has been uh, quite the day at Queens Park. I can tell you, I've been very busy since uh, Minister Clark uh, made an unexpected announcement that the government was going to uh, expand the green belt to, or at least, no, let's put that back, start a conversation about expanding the green belt. Uh, and so I just want to thank you. We decided to quickly uh, put together a conversation tonight uh, on this topic. And I've obviously been doing a lot of media today uh, discussing this. And so I'm really delighted to be joined by our Deputy Leader, Diane Sachs, former Environment Commissioner of Ontario, internationally renowned lawyer, uh, to join me in this conversation. And so as we begin, I just want to acknowledge that wherever you're tuning in in Ontario, uh, you're watching this uh, on Indigenous land. And I want to acknowledge that my home is located on the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation covered by Treaty 13, the Between the Lakes Purchase. And part of our conversation tonight is going to touch on the Duffins Creek wetland in Durham region. And I just want to acknowledge, uh, I think just the powerful words that the uh, Scugog, Mississauga of the Scugog Island First Nation um, have said about the importance of the Duffins Creek wetland. Uh, they've written a letter to the minister opposing the ministerial zoning order uh, that would pave over that land, that, those wetlands for uh, a warehouse. And I've had some excellent meetings with leaders of uh, the Mississaugas of Skulagog First Nation on that particular issue. And just want to say, I've just been grateful of the wisdom and knowledge that um, those, those Indigenous leaders have imparted me to me, particularly on that issue. And Diane, thank you for uh, joining me on such short notice. And I think we both have had very busy days today, uh, but this is an important conversation. And so for those of you who haven't maybe been following the news recently, the Ford government has been under a lot of, experiencing a lot of opposition. Uh, protesters at the Duffin Creek uh, wetland um, site strong opposition and a number of media stories uh, against the GTA West Highway that would pave over parts of the Greenbelt and 2,000 acres of prime farmland. Uh, a lot of pushback uh, on their efforts to gut the authority of conservation authorities uh, to use science-based and evidence-based decision-making when it comes to development uh, in, in particularly in watershed regions. And so I think in the face of a lot of that criticism, the government announced today their intention to initiate a conversation about expanding the green belt. About and maybe, maybe. Maybe, maybe expanding the green belt, exactly. And I just wanna be very clear that I've, I've been uh, very critical of the way in which they've rolled out this decision. Uh, but of course, the Green Party supports expanding the Green Belt. Uh, we're very supportive of the Crombie Commission's recommendations around expanding the Green Belt through the Blue Belt uh, and, and various waterways. And so I thought it would be important to have a conversation with, you know, one of Ontario's experts on this issue, and that's Diane Sachs. So Diane, thanks for, for uh, joining me. And uh, I want to begin um, by just uh, maybe asking you to unpack this announcement a little today to, quote, begin a conversation about possibly uh, expanding the Greenbelt. And what was your first reaction uh, when you heard the minister's announcement? Well, first of all, it's a classic bait and switch. Uh, the government, the Ford government is doing immense harm to present and future generations by using their powers. They've concentrated their powers and use those powers to drive through developments, um, paving wetlands, wetlands and farmland across Ontario for the benefit of their big donor friends in ways that are doing enormous damage and will do enormous damage for a long time. And it is 
heartening to see that there has been enough public opposition to stop at least one of those destructive projects. We saw the announcement earlier this week that the glass factory in Stratford, um, the company has abandoned the project because of strong public opposition. And so my read of it was, okay, the government is now experiencing enough pushback that they need to do something. And so what they're doing is to give up something that isn't hard for them to give up and to try to distract public attention from the enormous harm that they're doing for the benefit of their friends. Uh, you mentioned the Duffins Creek wetland, for example. Um, it is of course of uh, indigenous importance, but provincially significant wetlands on the shores of the Great Lakes are very rare and they are important for all of us who live around the Great Lakes and particularly for the people who live in that area, wetlands provide flood protection, they provide habitat, they uh, clean the water, they clean the air, they provide noise protection. We have very few of them. As I reported to the legislature, we've already destroyed most of the important wetlands in Southern Ontario. The ones that are less are incredibly precious. And as the climate crisis advances, we need them more and more and more. So the, this, is, this is just bait and switch. Yeah, it's interesting you talk about the, the Duffin Creek wetland. And what I find so infuriating about that particular ministerial zoning order is that both the current and previous mayor of Ajax have both said, there's plenty of land already zoned for warehouses that would be completely appropriate places to build a warehouse uh, in the region. So why they would choose to destroy a provincially significant wetland to do it is, is just beyond my comprehension at this point. And, and so oh, I'm, I- <laughs> Mike, I think, we, I think we know, but we know why, right? We, we follow yep. the money. We, can, we really can see that the Ford government is helping a small number of rich developers who donate extensively to get them elected. Um, this is about allowing their friends to make a lot of money in the short run regardless of the cost to the public, regardless of the cost to the future, regardless of cost to the environment. So I wish it was inexplicable. <laughs> it's not. You answered my question. So um, I, wanted to, I wanted to step back a bit, Diane, because I feel like uh, over the last six months in particular, I mean, throughout the entire two and a half years of Ford government has been in power. It's been one sort of environmental setback after another one of them firing you, <laughs> uh, our, our environmental commissioner. But it's been particularly relentless, I think, in the last eight months or so. And I just was hoping maybe you could outline some of the ways in which our environmental protections have been under attack uh, in the last eight months or so during a COVID pandemic. My, my read of it is slightly different than yours. Mike, I think that the pace of environmental attack has been relentless and continuous since the day he took office. But the more recent ones are the ones that are maybe um, more obvious to us right now. Part of what's happened too is this has been a coordinated plan of attack. So we saw the government change the Planning Act to increase the power of the minister to issue these ministerial orders and to concentrate the power to override good planning and environmental protections in a single person. This was something that the government did a year ago and they did it in order to give themselves the power to do what they're doing right now. So in other words, this didn't just happen. It just didn't come out of thin air. There has been a concentrated campaign to allow them to give these protected lands to developers at, uh, without the public being able to do anything about it. So they have changed the law to give themselves the ability to do it. And now they're using the power that they've given themselves. Meanwhile, of course, not only did they prepare by changing the law, they've also weakened any other institution that could have stood in the way. They have deliberately tied the hands of the conservation authorities. That took some time. 
Um, as you say, they abolished my office uh, to shut down the, the watchdog. Um, they cut funding to many other kinds of organizations, including the indigenous organizations. So anyone who might have been able to stand in their way has been systematically underfunded, undercut, undermined, shut down for the last couple of years so that these ministerial zoning orders could take place and they have taken advantage of the pandemic when people are understandably focused on other issues to ram through a lot of these measures when they hope nobody would have the energy to stop them. And they've been right on the whole that they have done so much environmental damage on so many fronts so rapidly that by and large people haven't mobilized to stop them. Um, the Stratford case is just another example that when people do actually mobilize, some of this damage can be stopped, but they are relentless and there's enormous amounts of money at stake Whereas the opponents, by and large, it's, uh, are volunteering their time and have limited resources. So it's not been a fair fight, but they designed it to be an unfair fight. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And, and it's been hard because I've been trying to raise these issues in the legislature, but most of the media and most of the other opposition parties and most of the conversation has rightfully been focused on COVID and how we're going to get through this pandemic and how we're going to deal with the immediate economic and public health crisis that many people are facing. And so that's what like really encouraged me to see the pushback that we've seen um, against the glass factory, against the, the uh, Duffins Creek um, uh, wetland, uh, against the GTA West Highway, uh, et cetera. So people seem to be starting to realize that there is a pattern here. And, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to um, talk a little bit about uh, how wetlands, farmland, woodland, natural heritage and green space, like why is it so important to protect it? Because I think some people are like, we're in this crisis, we need jobs, we need economic development. Why are you greens talking about protecting wetlands? Well, yes, we need jobs, but the price of a short-term construction job at the cost of destroying something irreplaceable that we need for our protection is way, way too high. And as you say, there is no shortage of land for warehouses. We have enormous amounts of area within existing urban boundaries where those warehouses can go. Um, I reported to the legislature, as you know, on exactly why these areas are so essential for wildlife, of course, but also for people. Um, wetlands, we've talked about a little bit, but let's think about it a bit more. We know that the climate crisis is making storms more intense. The air is warmer, there's more evaporation, so there's more water in the air. When a storm comes, the water falls faster. So we have fiercer storms, as well as longer droughts. Um, the droughts are incredibly damaging to farmers, to agriculture, to forests, to urban trees. Um, the floods are equally destructive to agriculture and uh, and forest, but also incredibly destructive to person, people's property, to homes. Basement floods on average cost in excess of $40,000. Most people don't have an extra $40,000 sitting around in the bank just for the time when, when there's a heavy rain um, and rely on insurance, but insurance is increasingly unwilling to cover those basement floods either. And the more often the floods occur, the less insurance coverage there is, the more people are left completely unprotected. Every time we destroy a wetland in Southern Ontario, we materially increase the risk of damaging floods and droughts. And what does a wetland do? Well, when that heavy, heavy rain falls out of the sky um, in these more intense storms that climate change is bringing us, where does the water go? But well, when you have a forest, 
almost all that water gets slowed down by the leaves and goes into the soil and seeps into the groundwater and moves slowly and gently through the watershed, nourishing everything as it goes. When you build a subdivision or a warehouse, most of the water is hitting roofs or pavement and it rushes off tremendously fast, dirty, warmer, causing erosion and destroying everything as it goes. So we transformed water from being life-giving to death-giving. A single spot of wetland, a two hectare wetland can protect 70 hectares all around it from flooding and to some extent from drought. In addition to moderating the temperatures, we don't have as much of a, these extreme temperatures we get in the summer reducing noise and providing a place for, for birds and wild creatures of every kind. And also keeping our lakes clean. We want, almost everybody that I know wants clean water. Well, what cleans the water? It's not magic. What cleans the water primarily is wetlands. It cleans the water better than anything people can do. Um, we do have sewage plants, which do some cleaning. They're not nearly as good as the wetlands. And we've got a multi-billion dollar deficit in our stormwater infrastructure, which is why, as I reported to the legislature, I think in the last year I reported, we had 1,672 yeah. raw sewage overflows in Ontario that the government knew about. Some of them the size of many, many Olympic swimming pools of feces and mucus and blood and urine and metal and grease and vomit um, going directly into the lakes where we get our drinking water for most cases and where we want to be able to eat fish and, and swim. And that filth that we put into the lake, it doesn't just vanish once it goes into the lake. Um, it continues to cause problems and to build up and make it more likely for us to have toxic algae. So we're poisoning our own nest. We're poisoning our own world. We're poisoning the places we live. And every time we cut down the protection, we're making ourselves more nakedly vulnerable to these storms that we know are coming. When you combine dramatic underfunding of the infrastructure, which these four government is doing. Remember, they, these are the people who cut off all money for the Clean Water Act, plus increasing sprawl, which turns services that can absorb water into hard services, which in this government is turbocharging sprawl, plus climate change. We're, you know, it's like that old cartoon, you sit at the end of a branch um, and you cut off you cut the branch off yourself so that you're gonna fall. Well, that's what this is. The science has been clear for decades. And yet, even though we know exactly what we must do, we know why it's precious, it doesn't matter to this government because the benefits are shared by all of us. They are throwing that away so that their friends can pocket enormous amounts of money. These are people who are already very, very, very rich. So they're making the rich richer by making all of us poor and leaving us naked in the face of the hammer blows that climate change is bringing to us. It is completely unconscionable. Young people should be up in arms, but it's not just young people. People of any age are going to suffer from this. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thank you for putting it so graphically. And I remember writing the press release the day that you uh, did the report on the, on the sewage because I just, oh. That was, that was a tough one. Um, I wanted to ask you, so some of these wetlands, like Duffins Creek, for instance, isn't even in the Greenbelt. It's outside the Greenbelt. And so some of the reporting has been, and actually some of the government's response to the criticism has been, well, you know what, if we do some of this stuff outside of the Greenbelt, but we protect the Greenbelt, then everything's okay. And then you have the Greenbelt Council, you know, led by David Crombie, all resign because of the attack on conservation authorities and the misuse of uh, MZOs. And the minister is like, well, none of this is in the green belt anyway. So, so like, what are they complaining about? And so I'm just wondering if you could talk about 
the importance of the land in and around the green belt as it relates to the integrity of the green belt? Well, I think it's broader than that, Mike, with, with, with all due respect. The green belt is important, but the approach that the conservatives take is that if we protect this one strip of land, sort of, and as I documented, they don't protect it very well, we can pave everything else. And that's nonsense. The green belt is one very important part of the ecosystem in the GTA, but it's only one part. It's like saying, you know what? If I take good care of my left arm, it doesn't matter if I cut, cut my legs off because after all, they're not in the right arm. It's totally foolish. There is no science to it. Um, it's again, just another kind of greenwashing. It's, it's this government saying over and over again, don't look at what we're really doing. Just look where we want you to look and you'll and be happy. And can you talk about, you talked about turbocharging sprawl and a bit about how these policies are um, benefiting a few people and particularly land speculators. And so can you maybe talk a bit about the GTA West Highway uh, proposal and the fast tracking of that and what that means for, you know, land speculation, sprawl, um, etc. The only reason to build that highway is to support much more sprawl. So again, so these same developers can build many, many more square kilometers of subdivisions and warehouses on land that should not be paved. Um, any fair environmental assessment of that highway would turn it down. It was assessed once before and turned down. We, I mean, almost anyone who pays attention knows we're in a climate and environmental crisis. We know that transportation emissions are our largest and fastest growing source of emissions. And what drives our transportation emissions are is urban sprawl. Again, my, my very last report to the legislature just two days before my office was abolished, we documented the role of urban sprawl in forcing people to drive everywhere, which leads to these, not only our enormous carbon footprint and a dependence on importing 16 to $25 billion of fossil fuels into Ontario every year, but also locks people into these lifestyles where you're spending hours every day in congestion, breathing dirty air, driving back and forth between your, your home and your work. And that's bad for the people involved. It's incredibly expensive for the municipalities involved. It's unbelievably destructive to our local natural environment. It fil filths, filth it, it makes the air filthy. It creates enormous climate damage and it locks people into a one-way street. Once you have turned a wetland or a farmland into a subdivision, you don't get it back. Uh, you've almost permanently destroyed the natural riches that were there. We know what we need to do to reduce our carbon footprint. And the first thing to do is to not build any more highways. And in particular, not to build any more highways to create sprawl. The highway is a bad idea. The sprawl is a terrible idea. We do need homes. Everyone deserves a home and we'll all be better off if everyone has one. But building subdivisions, building sprawl is exactly the wrong answer. We have lots of room within existing urban areas to have homes for everybody. Homes that don't lock people into dirty air and long commutes. Low, and it doesn't mean high rise condos either. Low rise, low carbon intensification of our existing urban areas has room for everyone. And that will mean a total cost of living that is lower. It will mean a better quality of life. It'll mean better public health. So everything that this government is doing is locking us into a high fossil, dirty air, poor health future in ways that will be really hard to undo. It's tragic. And, and the point I would like to make, because so many people think of conservative governments as being fiscally responsible, is just the fiscal irresponsibility of it. I mean, to spend 
six to ten billion dollars on a highway that's going to save people 30 seconds on their commute uh, and unleash sprawl and all the other costs that you've outlined um, to me seems the complete opposite of what fiscal responsibility would be. But I want to pick up on and elaborate a bit on what you were just saying, because sometimes people think, well, are you just against all development and our population is increasing? You know, we have more people moving to the GTA. And so how can the province develop and grow and accommodate an increasing population? Uh, while maintaining these strong environmental protections uh, that we would like to see? Well, we're working on the housing policy right now, um, but it is clear how to do it. No sprawl, no highways. Look at low carbon, low rise intensification within existing urban areas and building with wood, for example, will support our forest communities um, the building is faster, the, has much lower carbon footprint, and people are happier living in, in buildings with lots of wood. Um, and it sequesters carbon in the wood itself. We know that there would also, that one of the things that makes urban life good is having what you need nearby, not having to get into the car and drive somewhere. Well, what gives enough population to support local stores, local restaurants, local libraries, local cleaners. Well, it's a certain density of population. Um, if you think about large parts of the GTA, uh, Scarborough, for example, it was developed uh, assuming that you'd have in each house a mom and a dad and maybe four kids and, uh, and a grandma or another kind of relative. So that's what the, the sewers were sized for. And the assumption was that those were the number of people you'd have. And, and at the beginning they did. But these days, a lot of those houses will have one or two or three people in them. So you don't have enough people to support local stores and restaurants. Uh, and many of those areas, the population has stagnated for, for quite a long time. The people who live in those areas would be better off if there were enough gentle density to support a thriving ecosystem of the kinds of services that they themselves would use and having it close by. So you can walk or you can cycle or you could rollerblade or you could take transit um, or you could have a, a low carbon local delivery without having to get into a car and, and uh, an expensive car and then drive in dirty air to go get everything that you need and then bring it back again. If you also think about quality of life over a lifespan, um, there's a lot of people who can't drive. Either they're too young to drive or they're too old to drive or they have a medical condition that doesn't allow them to drive. And when you build subdivisions, those people are prisoners. They can't go anywhere by themselves. If you put them in a community where the things that are needed are accessible nearby on foot or by some kind of micro mobility, then they can be free adults. They can participate in, in the life the way they want to. And those of us who can drive now are going to get old. So this is something that's gonna to happen to all of us at some point or another, I mean, unless we do something else, don't get old. So thinking ahead to what serves everybody will serve all of us better. Mm -hmm. And it should bring down the cost of housing. I mean, that's another really important it thing. It would. Yeah, absolutely. No, very good and, point. And it brings down the combined cost of housing and transport. The government tends to talk about housing affordability all the time when all they mean is the upfront purchase price of a house. Mm -hmm. Ignoring the operating costs, ignoring the transportation costs, ignoring the taxes, ignoring the cost to the municipality of building all those services. It's a very high cost lifestyle when you count everything in, whereas infill within an existing urban area where you use the services that already exist and put money into great public spaces that can be shared, the total cost of living goes down and we increase social cohesion, which we really need to rebuild. I know we're getting to the point where we need to wrap up, but I wanna ask you, I think a really important conversation or a really important question given the conversation today is what would an honest conversation about the possible about greenbelt expansion look like 
and what could Greenbelt expansion look like through a process that um, had, had integrity? Well, you know, we have seen conservative governments do some land protection before. I mean, you remember even Mike Harris had the Land right. for Life where he, he did protect some areas. And so, you know, we really could see conservatives saying, we want to protect these areas. A lot of people who are conservatives love nature and the outdoors. Um, and they could say, we recognize that these areas that they're talking about, the, marine, the, the Gulf Moraine as well, similarly, a significant water source. Um, water is going to be under more and more stress as climate change advances. We've already seen a major drought in Ontario in 2016. Um, and so you could certainly imagine a government of any stripe that says, we know that destroying our water source is stupid. <laughs> And we know that the cheapest way to protect our water is to protect the land ab above it and keep it and keep it clean. And so we're going to propose expanding this in order to provide these protections and make the communities around them better. Well, is dishonest about it in this case is how it's being used as a smokescreen to try to distract people from the enormous damage from the many dozens of um, ministerial zoning orders that have been used to run roughshod over planning protection, environmental protection, public consultation, and the needs of the future. It's, it's the use of it to distract the public during a pandemic while they do so many other bad things that is offensive. The expansion of the green belt itself should have been done long ago. Um, and in addition, expanding the picture on the map is one thing. What really matters is giving the lands in the Greenbelt real protection. And this government does not do that. Driving a highway right through the Greenbelt is as clear an example as you could want that although they put it on a map, they don't actually protect it. Yeah, well, the, the honest conversation about expanding Greenbelt protection, and I would argue expanding protections in general for prime farmland that's outside of the green belt or wet, every wetland in Southern Ontario, given the fact that we've lost 75% um, of them, um, to me needs to be part of that bigger conversation that goes beyond uh, the green belt itself, but is integral to the green belt. So I appreciate you expanding people's knowledge and digging deeper into some of these really important issues because I think they need to be a front and center topic of conversation uh, at Queens Park and really across the province, uh, given some of the actions or many of the actions the Ford government's taken over the last two years and especially over the last few months. So thank you for taking the time tonight. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for including me, Mike. It's such a pleasure working with you. Likewise, likewise. So thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, I know if you go to the gpo.ca website, you can see uh, various take action efforts that we uh, are putting forward to help your voice be heard, uh, to put pressure on the government. And sometimes even if the government doesn't respond or backtrack on some of the uh, most egregious things they're doing, I think having your voice on the record and having a record of opposition is really important because there will be a next government and we can build on the things that we're doing right now to um, build a better future. And so I wanna thank you all for speaking out and for joining us tonight.